Mendel in Berlin, which is totally appropriate because uh, Professor Mendel is one of the very few American scholars, and uh, actually, unfortunately, for the Italian American scholars, who take interest in what, ha what is happening on the other side of the ocean. And uh, Professor Menzel is a specialist in uh, Ottoman uh, history and uh, economics. Uh, he uh, actually lived in uh, Turkey as a Fulbright scholar in 1998-1999. He was a uh, professor at uh, the uh, uh, Utah State uh, University. And he is now a senior fellow at uh, the Liberty Fund. So uh, join me and, uh, in listening to uh, what uh, uh, Professor Mentor is going to talk about, which is history, which is taxiology history, and the parents of history. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. This is so, is this? This one. All right. Is that working? Uh, no. No. Probably okay. Probably switch somewhere. Science, <laughs> yeah, switch somewhere. Yeah. And what about this one? That's, that's for. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's for uh, yeah, why? Yeah, turn, turn, turn it. Turn it. What we can do is this. Yeah, okay. Just use this one. Mm. Yeah, let's stick that right. in. Okay. But it's always okay. Okay. That's right. Volere um, potere. And uh, to turn this on. Let's see. You probably need to switch this off because otherwise. Oh, right. Well, uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Christian, for that very nice, uh, very nice introduction. It really is such a great pleasure for me to be here, uh, and um, it's a little difficult for me to follow such a wonderful, a wonderful uh, opening, uh, opening talk, especially since there aren't very many sort of knee slappers about praxeology, I'm afraid. Uh, but um, I hope that uh, what I have to say will nevertheless be of some, uh, be of some interest. I do have a couple of. Um, a couple of things to say by way of uh, disclaimers. Um, as Christian mentioned, I'm not actually uh, a, an expert in praxeology uh, or Austrian economics. I'm a little, bit, uh, a little bit outside of my intellectual comfort zone in making these remarks. And this is all the more uh, uh, difficult for me, I suppose, because I know that some of you in the audience are, in fact, uh, experts in praxeological science and Austrian economics. So I would welcome any comments uh, that, you, that you might have on this. Um, on this project. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing I wanted to say, uh, if it's not already apparent, is that this is the first time I've attempted to use PowerPoint technology. Uh, in all of those years as a professor, I never actually got around to learning how to use this. So I'm uh, trying it out for the first time uh, here in this, uh, in this venue. And again, we don't seem to have this up. Uh, so, so please uh, bear with me if this isn't, uh, if I'm having some there we are. Yep. Okay. So uh, let's hope it keeps. Uh, sort of kind of. Now yeah, still. Um, in. Does it have to warm up? There we go. Just on, it's up. There we go. Okay. okay good. Okay. Good. good. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and finally, the last uh, the last thing I have to say by way of a uh, just a, a kind of a disclaimer uh, is that these remarks are. Uh, my own, uh, they reflect my own research interests and ideas, and they're not meant to reflect uh, the, any sort of official position of Liberty Fund or any of Liberty Fund's other employees. So let's, uh, let's uh, take a look then at this, this subject in which I've become interested, praxeology, history, and the perils of historicism. And um, I got interested in this, uh, in this particular subject uh, largely from a series of conversations that I had that I've been having with a colleague in my office who's doing some work on historicism. And uh, that led me to go back and reread some of the writings of Ludwig von Mises on history. As a professional historian, this, uh, uh, I, I wanted to co go back and see what he had uh, to say about, uh, about history. And I came across this particular quote in Human Action. Um, the study of history makes a man wise and judicious, but it does not by itself provide any knowledge and skill which could be utilized for handling concrete tasks. And this quote uh, kind of startled me, I have to say, as a professional historian, 
because I wasn't really sure what it meant. Um, what what does this? What can this mean? How can the study of history make us wise, uh, but at the same time fail to teach us anything about handling concrete tasks? It seems like wisdom is somehow a necessary ingredient for handling concrete tasks, or to put it another way, that in handling concrete tasks, wisdom is somehow or other uh, something useful. It seems like they go together somehow. But um, uh, this quote seems quite, uh, seems to argue uh, otherwise. Um, this quote also, um, uh, also bothered me a little bit because I had to ask myself what, within an Austrian framework, what the role of a historian and indeed the discipline of history actually were. What is history really for within an uh, Austrian, uh, the context of Austrian, uh, Austrian economics? Um, and how do we make room um, in the Austrian project, in this kind of an intellectual landscape, for a field uh, such as history? So what I wanted to do in my remarks this morning was actually to try to tease out some tentative answers to these questions. Uh, and in particular, what I wanted to suggest is that for uh, von Mises, history was important not, not for its alleged predictive capabilities, uh, which he roundly rejected, but rather for its power to correct or at least guard against the conceit that human beings can know and pass judgment on others' ends. So in other words, I think that's what he meant uh, by talking about uh, handling concrete tasks. This was part of his overall warning about uh, a, a kind of hubris or conceit uh, about um, uh, knowing uh, the ends of other people. And in order to pursue this uh, investigation, what I want to do is to try to map out uh, Mises' scientific geography and see where and how history fits into it. And finally, the, by the end of my remarks, um, we should be able to suggest some ways in which history fits into Mises' overall system and how indeed it can make a man wise and judicious. So, away we go. Let's, uh, let's, let's start off uh, by looking at uh, Mises' uh, scientific system. Uh, the first major distinction in von Mises' system is between the natural sciences and the human sciences. Um, and he further breaks this down in, breaks the uh, human sciences down into uh, the science of human action. And I put this question mark over here because it seems like that there's another branch of the human sciences, but I couldn't quite find <clears throat> what it was. So that's why this, this box here uh, exists. Um, the main distinguishing feature of uh, the science of uh, human action um, is, uh, is the subject matter. Uh, individual human beings distinguished from all other animals uh, are distinguished from all other animals in their ability to act according to rational calculations. And there's this uh, uh, famous, uh, famous quote um, where he talks about uh, praxeology. The science of human action is itself broken down into two fields, praxeology and history. So, so there's the science of human action. Oops. And then the science of human action when Mises breaks down into praxeology and history. Um, praxeology, uh, Mises wrote, is a priori. All its theorems are products of deductive reasoning that start from the category of action. History, on the other hand, is by definition a posteriori. It represents the totality of human experience. I think I have. So in other words, um, these, two, uh, these two fields, praxeology and history, though both part of the science of human action, uh, occupy different sorts of spaces. Praxeology is a priori, and history for von Mises is a posteriori. Um, yet, it is helpful to keep in mind that Mises puts both of these under the category of the science of human action. So what is it exactly that seems to justify this? The key factor linking these two branches is human action itself. 
While praxeology reasons a prioristically, starting with the category of action, history reasons a posteriori, using the record of human action. In other words, the crucial point of Mises' entire scientific architecture is human action. But unlike the actions of other animals, human action involves choice. As Mises said, man is the acting animal. He chooses between conflicting ends. It is precisely this that is the theme of both praxeology and history. So in other words, uh, so far, we're at a state where praxeology and history are not perhaps that widely separated after all. They share really a great deal in common in this intellectual landscape that Mises is constructing. Now, according to uh, Mises, praxeology and history are each dominated by a particular branch or sphere, what do you call the sphere, spheres. For praxeology, this is the field of economics, or to be more precise, what von Mises called, oops, oops, what von Mises called uh, catalactics. So here again, praxeology being broken up into these different fields. And again, from what I've read in different places in my research, Different authors put something called conflict theory as a branch of praxeology, and some of them put game theory in here, although that seemed to be somewhat contentious, whether that belonged as a field of praxeology. Mises himself focused on something he called catalactics. Um, uh, this term, uh, catalactics, was coined by the English economist um, and theologian Richard Waitley. Oops. Um, in 1833, and it's derived from the Greek term katalasso, uh, a verb that means change or exchange. By using this term instead of economics, Mises and later Hayek, I think, wanted to emphasize again the importance of purposeful action among individual people. Note here that with catalactics, we are still dealing with a priori knowledge. That is to say, to understand what happens during an exchange and why an exchange takes place, we must resort to a priori universal laws of economics, such as supply and demand. A catalactic exchange of goods or services, the basic component of any economic system, is governed by the same laws, regardless of the particulars of the case. Regardless, that is, of where or when the exchange is transpiring. So in other words, uh, von Mises believed that these laws of economics are the same no matter where or when uh, a, a catalactic exchange is, um, uh, is happening. For example, using our knowledge about economic laws, we can tell a plausible story about the price um, of apples, uh, about apples in the marketplace. We can draw not only upon our a priori knowledge about supply and demand, but also on our knowledge about the effects of government manipulation of the money supply for example. Um, it's also worth, uh, worth noting that um, these uh, laws, again, uh, these, laws of, uh, these economic laws are as valid for a discussion of the price of apples in London in 2010 as they are for an investigation of the price of apples in Constantinople in 1020. Uh, so in other words, these are a priori truths that apply to, this is a picture of medieval Constantinople. And, uh, and of course, a famous London, uh, London market. So in other words, these laws of economics are not contingent upon time or place. It should also be noted that Mises held that catalactic laws were a priori true. That is, they did not need to be deduced by observable, uh, observable phenomenon. They were also capable of being demonstrated logically, just as were the basic laws of mathematics. While this kind of praxeological reasoning, therefore, can explain a great deal about a particular market transaction, what they cannot explain, uh, for instance, is why John buys apples instead of oranges. They can explain the price of apples, uh, whether it's in London or Constantinople, whether it's in the 21st or uh, 11th century. But this, uh, but this aspect of praxeological science can't explain why John buys apples instead of oranges. Or to put it another way, why does John value apples more than oranges? Note that this is an entirely different sort of question than what apples cost, and it's the kind of question that cannot be answered using any a priori laws or knowledge. 
It's a historical question. We have to, in order to answer that question, we have to know, we have to have some idea of what might have occurred to John in the past to lead to his preference for apples over oranges. And to describe this branch of history that seeks to understand the value judgments people make, Mises employed the term timology. There we go. Oops. There we go. Uh, the term timology. This, uh, this term, it seems, was uh, first used um, by the German historian Wilhelm Dilthey uh, and later the English historian uh, R.G. Collingwood. It's based on the Greek, uh, the Greek word timi that means estimation, value, or worth. So timology thus, as this quote says, deals with the mental activities of men that determine their actions. That is, it examines how and why John comes to value apples over oranges at the market. Um, and it's important, by the way, that the object of this, his, of this hypothetical historical investigation is John, a person called John, and not people of John's socioeconomic class or people of John's ethnicity or any of the myriad other sociological or anthropological categories to which John could be assigned. This is because a choice, for, the example, for example, the choice to buy apples instead of oranges, is an example of purposeful action, which we know can only be carried out by an individual human being. So let's see where I am with these slides here. I think I've gotten a little bit. Oh, there's the valuation of these things. There's Dilty. Okay. So here's again this uh, this schematic. So there's history, there's timology. I wasn't sure if I could find some other uh, sphere of history that Mises talks about, but there may be one, so I put a, a question mark there. Catalactics up there. Now, so we finally made our way back to something that most of us will recognize as history, right? Talking about John deciding whether or not to buy apples or oranges. This is a historical uh, kind of a question. And according to, I think anyway, according to Austrian, this Austrian scientific landscape, we answer that question of why John prefers apples over oranges by employing this the sphere of history called timology, uh, where we try to investigate his valuation, why people value certain things over others. In other words, we're telling stories about people doing things, which is what historians are generally uh, taken to do. Um, but how does any of this make us wise and judicious? What does any of this have to do with being wise and judicious? And, and also, why is it that this can't help us make any concrete decisions. We're back to that original quote that uh, I found uh, so, uh, so perplexing. Well, to answer these questions, we have to dig just a bit deeper into Mises' formulation of the science of human action. And in the process, we'll come face to face with, with what was for von Mises, the real villain of the entire piece, historicism. We get to historicism, however, via an, by an interesting route. Recall that so far we have two related but different scientific processes at work describing a particular action, catalactics and timology, right? Catalactics provides us with the a priori economic laws that tell us what apples and oranges cost, and timology uh, gives us the tools to determine why uh, John prefers apples over oranges. Um, uh, Right, so what's missing, though, is the mechanism that makes timology work. How, do, how does the historian know what particular mental activities, this is timology is described by Mises as a mental activity, how does the historian know what particular mental activities determine John's choice of apples instead of oranges? Well, as it happens, Mises was fortunate enough to have at his disposal just such a mechanism. This was a methodology pioneered uh, by the historians uh, Droysen and Dilty. Uh, called in German Verstehen. Uh, and the basic translation of this into English is simply to understand. But in this context, in the sociological context, it's used to describe a process by which the historian attempts to penetrate the mind of the subject 
in order to understand his motivations. So here, in other words, for von Mises, Verstehen is the mechanism that makes timology work. It's the workhorse of the process of timology. It, what's, it's what, it is what makes timology possible. Verstehen also implied that the historian be capable of empathy with his subject and that he have intuition about his subject's motivations. According to uh, Mises, Verstehen refers to value judgments and the choice of ends and of means on the part of our fellow men. Now this, of course, if you're thinking, uh, uh, sounds like a very kind of rigorous and demanding process, it is. Uh, the hi historical investigator um, had to know as much as possible about, about the biography of his subject as well as the overall environment in which he lived, while at the same time, the historian had to guard against smuggling in his own feelings and prejudices. This in turn led to what was known in the 19th century as the objectivity problem. And I'm going to leave that aside for the, uh, for the moment. So the discussions regarding Verstehen, and indeed the proper way to approach history, emerged out of the Herculean efforts of such early historians as Ranke, whoops, there's Collingwood, and Leopold von Ranke and Friedrich Meinecke to turn history into a genuine field of scholarly inquiry instead of a kind of subset of literature uh, or folklore. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to say anything bad about literature or folklore. In case there are any, um, anyway, just thinking about the remarks of this morning, I don't want to be accused of running down uh, uh, folklorists. Uh, in so doing, um, uh, people, uh, early historians like Ranke and Meinecke stressed the primacy of individual human agency. As far as they were concerned, the tools of Verstehen were meant to be applied to individual historical actors, actual individual people. This, in turn, was one of the earliest understandings of the term historicism, the use of uh, the tools of history to be applied to individual people to understand their actions. For Ranke, the term historicism meant that a historical subject could be understood by using Verstehen to understand the motivations and goals of particular human beings. And a corollary to this approach was that these motivations and goals were themselves influenced by the historical realities of the time in which the subject lived. So in other words, for these early historians like Ranke and Meinecke, they're engaged in a very interesting kind of process. On the one hand, the unit of analysis was the individual human being, on the other hand, they recognize that to understand the motivations and actions of the individual human being, those could not be divorced from the historical context in which the person lived, hence the term historicism. Ah, but something very strange happens to this uh, view of historicism by the early uh, 20th century. Ranke's original conception of historicism uh, started to undergo some profound changes. And these were largely due to one of his students, uh, von Schmoller. Uh, Schmoller was came to be associated with what is known to history as the younger German historical school of economics. He developed the idea that not only is some knowledge of historical context important in the successful application of Verstehen, so so far he's with his former mentor, right? You have to have some concept of historical context. But, but um, historical phenomena and individual historical action are actually contingent upon the cultural and historical context in which they occur. You see? So he kind of ups the ante, as it were. He says, not only do we need to understand the historical context to understand a person's action, but that context the historical realities in which a person acts actually influence that person's agency. The person becomes a, a, a contingent aspect of the historical process itself. In a way, what, what Schmoller, uh, Schmoller did was to stand this older understanding of historicism almost completely on its head. Furthermore, um, this led, um, this led uh, Schmoller uh, and later Werner Zombard, uh, into a conflict with the emerging Austrian school of economics, a battle that was later called the Methodenstreit. 
And in a 1929 critique of the Austrian school, I think I have Zombart here. No, sorry. Uh, Zombart, uh, Zombart wrote, they, uh, the Austrians, take no account of the historical forces which affect the working out of historical principles. And as a matter of fact, Zombart's statement was largely accurate. Um, Mises developed his science of praxeology, as we've seen, based on the idea that historical, sorry, that economic laws are not historically contingent. They're a priori true. So you can see this, uh, the way that these two, uh, these two uh, fields uh, by the early 20th century had come, uh, had come into conf conflict. In fact, Mises uh, believed that this uh, German historical school of economics was very deeply flawed. He criticized especially their conceit that human actions, and economic actions in particular, are contingent on the historical context in which they take place. Mises found the implication of this line of thought profoundly troubling, for this implied that there were no basic economic laws. It was all a moving target. It was all completely contingent on, uh, on historical uh, phenomena. If this were the case, then policymakers in each age were free to develop their own historically contingent set of economic laws which von Mises rightly feared, would inevitably call for statist interventions in the working of the market. The end result would be the, bureau the bureaucratization of society, the establishment of the human society as what Mises called the world post office, uh, which is something that he, um, that, he, uh, greatly, uh, that he greatly feared. The only hope of escape uh, from such a nightmarish fate, there's Zombard, the only hope of escape from such a nightmarish fate of bureaucracy and the uh, world post office, uh, Mises believed, was the basic recognition of certain prax a priori praxeological laws, especially those of economics, that held true for all people in all times and places. So here's a nightmarish vision of, uh, of, of the world post office or the world insurance company, as well as with uh, with Franz Kafka and uh, Max Weber together uh, drowning in, uh, in, uh, in documents. Um, it's also worth noting that these fears that uh, Mises had uh, about the project of the German historical school, and especially Schmoller's role in this, uh, were not something he was just making up. Schmoller was actually uh, a great advocate of the bureau bureaucratization of the German state and also came to advo advocate uh, German overseas um, imperialism. But the dangerous work of Schmaller did not end with his rethinking of Ranke's historicist project. He also came to believe that the individual as a historical subject could be an actual human individual, an actual human being. But according to Schmoller and Zumbart and their reworking of the idea of historicism and historical science, they also uh, argued uh, that an individual could also be a particular class or nation. That is, they developed the idea that a class or nation could also act as an individual in this, uh, in this kind of project. So in time, the main subjects of historical inquiry ceased to be real individual human beings who were relegated to what amounted to short cameo appearances in the broader narratives involving the lives of individual nations. So under the tutelage of Schmoller and Zombart, historicism came to take on a meaning almost exactly the opposite of what Ranke had originally intended. That is, it advocated a view, it, this later historic view of historicism is developed by uh, Schmoller and Zombard. It advocated a view of the world in which the key actors are groups of people, especially nations and states, which are in turn more or less at the mercy of an ever-changing historical context. One attempt to pull back from this kind of collectivist understanding of historicism was provided by Max Weber, sometimes considered a representative of what has been called the youngest historical school of uh, the youngest German historical school. Weber's contribution was to try to strike a balance 
between the bearers of agency, uh, sorry, it was to strike a balance between the bearers of agency by inventing the idea of the ideal type. This was theoretically a single individual, a peasant, a king, a merchant, a bureaucrat, but at the same time, Weber was very clear that these types, these ideal types, were not meant to be actually really existing people, but were rather intellectual constructs who demonstrated all the characteristics of the particular type of person under investigation. As one scholar put it, for Weber, the ideal type is to be derived in inductively from the real world of social history. Pure ideal types are derived from historical reality and are one-sided exaggerations of the essence of what occurs in the world. Now, the reason that I bring this up here is because Mises and Weber had a very interesting relationship. They read one another's work and actually respected a great deal uh, the uh, projects of the other. Um, and uh, von Mises, as we've seen, actually appropriated the concept of Verstehen largely as it was developed uh, by Weber. Um, but he nevertheless, Mises that is, nevertheless recognized the dangers implicit in Weber's idea of the ideal type. And instead, Mises insisted that the tools of Verstehen should be brought to bear against real individual human subjects without reference to any preconceived notions about what their particular desires or motivations might be. Mises believed that this was possible despite the infinite variations in human motivations because of what he called, Mises called, the logical structures of the human mind. He believed that even though people were infinitely different, that people's ends differed tremendously, he, all human beings shared a similar logical scaffolding, a similar, log a similar logical structure of the mind. Uh, and it was precisely this that allows the historian to encounter the shared humanity of his subject and to try to understand the timological explanations for his subject's actions. So to conclude, where does all of this lead us? If we come back to that original quote that I found so troubling and maybe see what it, what it might actually mean in practice for a working historian. Can we form some working hypotheses about the relationship between praxeology and history, these two branches of Misenzian social science? The key here, it seems to me, is to recognize the limits of what Mises believed history was capable of. History is the record of human action, Mises wrote in theory and history. But more than that, history is a record which is supposed to be able to explain why people behaved in the ways that they did within the context of the laws of economics. It's important to note that this explanation was absolutely not supposed to constitute a proof of those laws which are a priori true and known through deductive logical reasoning. Equally important was Mises' contention that history has no predictive power. This was because it deals with individual human beings and their subjective wants and motivations, which were unique and therefore impossible of duplication. <clears throat> this is an important insight, for it distinguishes the homo sapiens of human history, real people, from the homo economicus, that strange species of humanoid automaton which populates the world of neoclassical economics. In other words, it, uh, it focuses on actual real consumers, real uh, people making choices uh, in the marketplace. As already noted in, this in my introduction, it's in this sense that history by itself does not provide any concrete knowledge and skill which could be utilized for the handling of concrete tasks. All this is not to say that Mises found history irrelevant or useless. Indeed, it is easy but misleading to ignore the important words by itself in the passage. History by itself, right? While history by itself may be severely limited, Mises clearly believed that when grounded in praxeological theory, history can help to explain why certain historical events happened in the way that they did. This understanding of the past can indeed help make a person wise and judicious. 
That's because understanding that the world functions in the way it does, because billions of individual human beings make countless daily decisions based on their subjective desires and motivations, which we can never hope to understand, is not only intellectually humbling in itself, but should also be a powerful antidote to the hubris underlying social engineering and economic planning, which any wise and judicious person should recognize for the dangerous hokum that they are. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and for putting up with my, uh, with my first attempt at PowerPoint technology. So thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen.